We are Godzilla. The best way to survive in the international system is to be, as we used to say when I was a young boy in New York City playgrounds, to be the biggest and baddest dude on the block. You seem to think that the, you know, the, all the ideas and then the theories can travel as freely as possible. Um, from, the, from, a, from a Western scholar's perspective, or maybe even a prominent established scholar's perspective, that may, that may be the case. But from the per peripheral scholar's perspective, the, the, the ideas and the, and the theories, they don't travel and, you know, in the same way. It's very similar to the real world. You either need a visa, money, a sponsor to, to move beyond your borders. If you don't attend the ISA regularly, if you don't make friends there with, from those journals, then the chance of you getting published is, is next to almost nothing. This market is an exclusive club. What would you think about this? This, this position. Yeah, I, I just make a couple points. Uh, one is, and I w wanted to say this uh, earlier to your earlier comments. If, if you look at uh, elite universities in the United States today, uh, there are lots of non-Western students in those PhD programs. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's not like we have a bunch of sort of people who look like me, uh, a bunch of, you know, white Anglo-Saxons uh, or white Americans who, who dominate and uh, keep out other people. I, I'm frequently in conversations on Zoom with four or five people where I'm the only American. Uh, uh, you know, there are just lots of lots. I, I've trained lots of Turkish students, Chinese students, right? Uh, Korean. I, I think I've trained more Korean students than any other group. I go to Korea, and you know, and I just say to you that the West is actually quite welcoming, uh, and we like new ideas. I mean, academia is a place that privileges innovation. It's not, a, it's not a place that, I mean, there is, a, there is this imperative towards conformity. I, it's not absent, believe me, I understand that. But there, there is an imperative towards innovation, to saying something new, right? And, and you don't want to underestimate that. So we bring in non-Western PhD students. And the truth is, I don't see much difference between them and stereotypical American students. If I bring in somebody from Bangladesh, right, that student basically is not much different than somebody who comes from Los Angeles or, you know, Nebraska. It's just, I don't see that much difference. Now, you would say that's because that student has been socialized earlier to want to conform. I think if you had a student who came from Turkey to the United States, who was really an independent variable, he or she, you know, could think for themselves and they thought they had a clever strategy, excuse me, a clever theory about how to think about X or Y or Z, that that student would be kind of a Bolshevik and would be in your face or in my face telling me they got a new way of thinking about things. And I think the system, assuming that the theory made sense, would reward that person. So I, I just, I don't see... I mean, I see some socialization for sure, but I, I don't see um, as much socialization as you see. And then the other, you want? Go, why don't you go ahead? Um, no, actually, th th that's wonderful. The, the, for example, the when we look at the Turkish example, because you refer to Turkey, the it's like look, admitting for training is one thing. And 
and admitting them in a way, admitting them in a way that they can bring in, they can bring in original, that's where we call homegrown, philosophies, ideas to, to, into, the, into the table is another thing. <laughs> By the time a student gets his or her education in Turkey, a BA, let's say, right? and then get socialized into international studies, international relations. And by the time that student gets also selected based on the GPA, everything else, and the recommendation letter, by the time that student gets into a good graduate school, so-called good graduate school in, in North America, particularly, which we all went through, many of us went through, that person is already assimilated. That person in his or her mind is already assimilated and is already part of this dependent development that that person thinks that success means adding to what exists, publish in what it's been published, and become part of the existing club already, and then go back to their country, which I did, for example, and represent the West there, be the ambassador of those ideas and those theories, and get the acknowledgement. I think sometimes our, um, our, our Western colleagues, established colleagues, what they don't follow, how dependent and how assimilating how homogenizing this whole mechanism is. For example, when I first did my graduate studies, when I wanted, at McGill actually, when I said, hey, can I, can I bring in, my, for example, I was from the land of Sufi, right? I grew up in Konya. There was a, there was a, a, a ancient you know, philosophy, this and that. It was like I was, they were more interested in me providing evidence for their theories that I, I meant to be a station chief for ideas that were already produced. I wasn't meant to be a contributor out of the philosophy, even an ancient philosophy, and a perspective from my own land, for example. I, I should stop, sorry. It's, it's well, your it, talk. Yeah. I, I would just say it's too bad you didn't come to the University of Chicago instead of go to the Hill. <laughs> and if you okay. would work... If you had worked with me, uh, I would have given you plenty of room to roam. Uh, All right. Look, All right. I just I want to just push this a bit further because it's a very important issue. Mm -hmm. You're basically saying that these young people who are educated in Turkey are educated almost completely on the basis of a Western canon, a Western literature a Western body of IR theories, and that you're effectively saying there are no homegrown theories that they are exposed to. Is that fair to say? Pretty much so, John, yeah. Why is that? What, what, I mean, I, I, I just want to be very clear here. I've dealt with lots of non-American, non-Western students, and they are every bit, it's satyrs paribus, they are every bit as good as Western students. It's not like Western students are smarter than non-Western students. That's not what's going on here, right? I, I have, I have some, had some Turkish students who are really whipsaw smart, okay? But you're telling me that when they come to the University of Chicago, they're no different than somebody coming from LA or Nebraska, right? There's nothing, there, there's not, I should expect nothing different from Turkish students. That's yeah. kind of hard. It, if that's no, true, it, it's kind of a hopeless situation, isn't it? it? it no, it, 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 it simply reflects the, the, the long years of dependent development that their professors in their home countries already were trained in the West or in Western you know, theories or Western theoretical thinking, that they already got socialized into a role that they want to continue because they think that's the way to success because this is a competitive world, I think. But the, otherwise, how can we explain that, look, Turkey is, an, uh, is, the, uh, is the, you know, 
is coming from an imperial past as well. There were look, different civilizations in here. There were, there were different perspectives, philosophies, all kinds of things. Yet there hasn't been, there hasn't been, and a, a, some 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 type of um, um, a theory or a theoretical application that reflects that past, that reflects that philosophy. It is more like most of us, all of us, in fact, we are pretty much busy and occupied with what we learned, not we, we not what we brought in to the table. Okay, just my final point on this, because we okay. should go back to questions. If there is a Turkish theory out there to be articulated, okay. yeah. and it hasn't been articulated, obviously. Somebody should articulate that Turkish theory, right? And yes. my arg your argument is it will be suppressed. I do not believe it will be suppressed. But first, you got to articulate the theory. I, I go through this when I go to China. The Chinese are actually kind of resentful that they employ Western theories. And they talk about the need to invent Chinese theories of international politics. And I always say it would be wonderful if you would invent Chinese theories of international politics, but they haven't done that yet. And the Turks have not invented, you have not invented a Turkish theory of international politics. And I would challenge you, you an owner, instead of writing another piece on the state of the field, right? What you should do is write a major theoretical work that differs from what people like me are saying in the West, that challenges us and offers us a new theory of international politics. I think that would be wonderful. And if you have trouble selling it around the globe, please contact me and I'll go to great lengths to help you purvey that theory all over the planet. Because you and I agree on the importance of theory and owner too. We all agree, right? Theory is God. So give us a new theory. That's a deal, John. No, I, 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 in fact, we even wrote another article basically making the claim that this is more like a peripheral responsibility. It is more like a peripheral responsibility rather than the core because the core doesn't have to make a move. It's the, you know, it doesn't. It's happy where, where, it, where it is, what it does, and it serves to also it's you know everything else. But you're right. It's 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 a peripheral responsibility, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, we're starting to run out of time, but there are a couple of questions that I think are so worth bringing up because uh, I think they're very interesting. Um, one of them is well, we see that a lot of the mainstream IR theories seem to fail in explaining some of the, uh, let's say, developments in the rest of the world. For example, um, let's look if we think about deterrence, for example, we see that some of the uh, ideas uh, that are developed in deterrence theory don't seem to hold very well when looking at the relation, uh, looking at India's relationship with Pakistan, for example, or when you, we look at India's relationship with the US and China, sometimes they seem to be very supportive of the US, other times they're different. So it, wh whichever way you seem to look at it, there seems to be a great deal of, um, let's say, inconsistencies. And so should we not um, maybe cons um, maybe bestow greater importance to locally developed theories since the people there themselves, you know, they experience a particular social reality. They have their own uh, perspective, their own sort of history as well. Um, should that not be, uh, should there not be, a, let's say, um, a stronger emphasis on trying to flesh out uh, these ideas and bringing, into, bringing them into a mainstream, uh, by our mainstream? Second question, if I may, since we're a little bit low on time, I also want to ask this. Um, assuming that language is important for the development of ideas and worldviews and thoughts, um, does the rest of the world or the non-Anglophone world, uh, aren't the people of the non-Anglophone world automatically at a disadvantage? Because even if they were to somehow come up with exceptional ideas or maybe 
uh, if they were to, if they were forced to think about a discipline in another language, would this not, let's say, stifle some of their thoughts? So is, isn't uh, the US and the UK, for example, at, at an automatic, uh, let's say, or I don't want to say they're at an advantage, but the rest of the world is at a disadvantage. Um, so those are two questions that I uh, think really worth, uh, that deserve, uh, I think, deserve some uh, attention. Sorry, please go ahead. Yeah, those are both excellent questions. Uh, let me take them in reverse order. Uh, okay. <clears throat> I think that you need uh, a lingua franca, you know, you need a common language. Uh, it happens to be English, right? And uh, from my point of view, that's a wonderful thing because I speak great English. And your point is, if somebody doesn't speak great English, doesn't that put them at something of a disadvantage? Uh, the answer is yes. I mean, how could it be otherwise, right? Uh, I, I, I can read a, somebody who's not terribly adept at the English language cannot read an article or a book as quickly as I can. Uh, so if you're going to get into this business and operate at the high end, you obviously have to speak English. And uh, I think, again, there's no way the, the global discipline could work without a common language, right? And you could argue it should be Chinese, but then those Chinese speakers would have an advantage over the non-Chinese speakers. It just happens that it's English. Uh, which, from my point of view, is a wonderful thing. But as you point out, it's going to put other people at something of a disadvantage. I don't think a big disadvantage. And many people around the world who are not sort of native English speakers speak English better than many Americans do. Uh, but your, your general point holds. I just don't see a way around it. Your first question, the fascinating question, which gets to the essence of what theory is, and we, we have not talked much about this at all. The reason that theory is God and theory is so terribly important is that the world is enormously complicated and we need simple tools for making sense of that enormously complicated world. And those simple tools are theories. And any time you come up with a theory, it's a simplification of reality. If you're a structural realist like me, what you focus on almost exclusively is the structure of the international system, which means you pay hardly any attention to domestic politics or to individual leaders. Right, whether a country is a democracy or an autocracy or a communist state, does it matter in my structural realist story, which is again, a simplification of reality? Well, sometimes those factors that you leave on the cutting room floor, when you develop your simple theory, they really matter. And that means your theory is gonna be wrong in that particular case. You know, I wrote this book with Steve Walt on the Israel lobby. It's called the Israel lobby and US foreign policy. I'm sure many of you have heard of it. Lots of people would say to us, because Steve is a realist like I am, do you guys realize that the Israel lobby book contradicts your realist theory? And we'd say, yes. And you could see the smoke coming out of their ears. How could that possibly be that they admitted that the Israel lobby contradicts their basic realist theory? Our argument is sometimes domestic politics matters. And in those cases where domestic politics matters, our theory is going to be proved wrong. My view, owner, is that if your theory is proved right, 75% of the time you're in the Hall of Fame. Okay, 75% of the time. That's my intuition. I can't prove that that's the right number. My intuition is you're right 75% of the time you're in the Hall of Fame. Peter Katzenstein once hearing me say that said, if you're right 50% of the time, you're in the Hall of Fame. 
All of this is to say that theories are sometimes wrong. There are real limits to what theory can do. But nevertheless, theories are indispensable. Now, your argument was that because these general theories are wrong, maybe if we developed local theories, they would do a better job. I'll go back to the woman who asked me, uh, I think, one of the first questions about theories, uh, her point that theories have general applicability. I think even homegrown theories, I think when you and Ursel invent your theory, right, it will have general applicability, right? All of that is to say your theory, let's assume that you produce a great theory, your theory will be wrong 25% of the time and right 75% of the time, right? So it's going to be wrong. So I don't see any meaningful difference between what you folks call homegrown theories or the existing general theories that are out there. They're all just limited tools. Very important to understand that. Theories have real limits. The real limits to what they can tell you, but they are absolutely indispensable. Theory is God. If you want to understand the real world, and this goes back to Ursula's earlier point, why theory is so popular in the periphery or the non-Western world, because scholars in the periphery or the non-Western world are much more interested in the real world, and they need theories to understand the world. That's why theory is God. But again, limits limits the theory, and I don't distinguish between homegrown theories and uh, Western theories. I think, for me, theories are theories. Who invents them is largely irrelevant. I think that matters more for you guys than it does for me, but that's sort of my bottom line on that.